Uh, good morning. It's good to see y'all this morning. Uh, for everybody that's joining us online, uh, blessings and God's encouragement to you. Uh, my name is Doug Baker. I'm one of the pastors here at Community Reformed Church, and uh, we get to talk about God's word today. Uh, we're uh, digging in uh, to the Gospel of John. Ever since the new year began, we have been uh, walking through this gospel, and we will all the way into and through Easter. Um, uh, in, in case you're a payer, attentioner of detail-y kind of persons, you're going to see that uh, the, the cloth on the cross is uh, white because it is Transfiguration Sunday, is the Sunday where Jesus is enveloped in light, and, he, uh, and three of his disciples, who are freaking out, hang out on a mountaintop with Moses and Elijah, uh, a powerful moment. Um, we're going to be talking about light today. Um, it's a, a theme in the Gospel of John. Uh, even as uh, we zoom in on uh, the particular stories, there are greater narratives that happen in the Gospels. Um, there are, are, are drums that our Gospel writers beat uh, because there are greater themes at, at play, even as they're telling us the particular stories of Jesus' life. Each of the Gospels kind of does that in a different way. They make different points that they want us to grasp. Uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew is, as he's telling the story of Jesus, seeking to bridge the gap between the Old Testament and this new covenant through Jesus Christ. Uh, the Gospel of Mark focuses in on the action. Mark is short and sweet, and it is always moving. Uh, the Gospel of Luke, Luke is a historian, and as he unpacks the story of Jesus, he wants to make sure that we're getting all the details. In John, John's big themes, John wants to talk about revelation. He wants us uh, to see the things that were once hidden, coming out into the light, and just how powerful that light is. John really wants us to grasp that Jesus is divine, that he is God. And so, uh, with that bigger theme going on, with these big uh, lessons that are happening, how, how is he going to help us to get that? As he tells us the stories of Jesus, of Jesus' interactions with people, the things he did, and the things that he said, how is he going to help us get that? Um, well, as we're digging in through these early chapters, especially once you get past like uh, into John 2, 3, and all the way through John 11, the, one of the ways that he's trying to get these bigger stories to play out for us so we can see them is he uh, focuses in on how those who opposed Jesus treated him like he was on trial, uh, like there's a court case going on. And here we are in chapter 9. And that means that Jesus has been on trial, quote unquote, on trial for a while. Not a real court case, not, not like in a court of law with an open, honest transparency, but kind of in a secret court. He's in the middle of a secret trial because they don't, they don't like how he's doing things. They, they don't like how he's shaking up their carefully constructed realities. Jesus has been demonstrating power and authority because he's God, and it's undermining the authority the Pharisees thought they should have. Now, <clears throat> I hope you get a chance, if you, if you get a chance to go back through these early chapters of John and just kind of read through them uh, as we're getting up to this point, I hope you get a chance to do that, um, to check this out, and you'll notice just how often uh, court-like words, law words are being used as, as the teachers of the law are accusing Jesus. And, 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 and so often part of Jesus' response to them is, is to use words like testimony and testify and witnesses and judgment. Uh, remember in, in chapter 8, he just, we just talked about this last week. And he said, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. Now, that's just one example. I hope you get a chance to go back, read through that. There is a court case going on here, an unofficial trial that is being uh, played out for everybody to see. Testimony is being submitted. Judgment is coming. And the Pharisees really think that they've got an open and shut case. What they're missing is how they're actually the ones in the hot seat. For what crimes? What is it that God is convicting them of? 
What is it that Jesus came to uh, absolve them of? That's where we get into our passage for today. Today we see a physical demonstration of a spiritual reality. A man permanently stuck in the darkness is given the ability to have a light, a life in the light. We'll be in John, uh, John, the Gospel of John chapter 9. We're going to start at verse 1. We'll get quite a ways into this story uh, before we continue on with the message today. Hear this God's word. As he went along, as Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned. This happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. See, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told, them, told him. Wash in the pool of Siloam, which is a word that means scent. And so the man went and washed and came home seeing. Now his neighbors and those who had for formerly seen him begging asked, isn't, isn't this the same man that used to sit and beg? And some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But the man himself insisted, I'm the man. Well, how then were your eyes open, they asked. And he replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and he, and he put it on my eyes. And then he told me to go and wash in Siloam, and I went, and I washed, and then I could see. Well, where is this man, they asked him. And he said, I don't know. And so they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. And now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. And therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. Well, he put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Now... Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? And so they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man replied, he's a prophet. Now, they still not, did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one that you say was born blind? How is it now that he can see? Well, we know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Um, ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. Now, his, his parents said this. Because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. And that's why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So a second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. Tell us what we want to hear, is basically what they're saying. And he replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, um, in, uh, in every moment that we come and, and we want to hear your word and we want to see the truth and, and we want to know who you are, um, we expect great things. We expect you to speak and so speak. Uh, Come into our midst, Holy Spirit, and grant us access to your truth. For the glory of God, and the glory of the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So it's kind of a second drum that John beats. Not only things uh, that were hidden coming out, not only that Jesus is divine, but that there is a battle being waged against the light and the dark. And the light is that which brings power and authority. What happened 
happens when you choose one instead of the other. This is what John wants us to get as he tells these stories. What happens in people? What happens in you? Not just in stories that you read about people, but what actually happens in a person when you choose the light instead of the dark. Now, I I hope that you've been catching how this has been unfolding. This has been this drumbeat over and over and over again about the power of the light and what it can do in this world ever since we opened this book of John. It started right at the beginning in John 1, where it tells us that Jesus, the light of the world, has come, and the darkness could not overcome him. And then the next thing that happens is he begins to show his authority and his power against corruption and darkness. There's a a water and a wine. There's a, a, a purging of the temple. This corruption must go. He begins to teach the teachers. He offers them living water. He uh, demonstrates his authority over infirmity. A young boy with a fever is healed. A man who was lame for 38 years gets up and walks. He explicitly speaks about his authority. I have authority. And then he shows his power over hunger by feeding thousands. He walks on the water And we see that the physical world's laws do not govern him. And for anyone who will walk in the light with him, they will follow in his footsteps out into wherever. Now he's ramping up. This is the truth, ramping up, increasing the revelation of the light. And now there's been some confusion. We can't reconcile these things. We're not quite understanding. How can this be true? And how can this be true? We don't quite get it. And so Jesus wants them to grasp this. He says, folks, just in case you aren't getting it, I have authority over the darkness of the soul. And he heals a blind man. I am the light of the world. But he's not done. The story is going to continue to ramp up. We're not there yet, but I'm going to, I'm going to spoil it for you. Okay? In just a couple more chapters of John, he's going to raise the dead. He even has power over death. These miracles, these things that Jesus is doing, these are his testimony. These are the proof that he is who he says he is, that the light comes with power and authority. This is the declaration of God himself through Jesus Christ. This is what the presence and power of the light looks like. This is what the power of God looks like. How can you ignore it? How can you ignore it without setting your heart against it? How can you ignore it without making a conscious choice? La, 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 I'm not gonna see that. You can't. You have to purposefully choose with perseverance to ignore what's happening here. And then that becomes your decision and that becomes your judgment. The Pharisees thought that they were administering justice toward Jesus and Jesus is basically leveling the charge that their reticence will bring God's judgment on them. It's it's right after he heals Lazarus and brings him Lazarus and brings him back from the dead. It's it's right after that that the Pharisees finally just like go all in with the darkness. It's at that point that they decide, yeah, no matter what, we're killing this guy. Corruption flourishes in the dark. Listen to what it says in Matthew 13. Uh, And this passage is quoting from Deuteronomy and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah. So this isn't the first time God's people have heard this. Though seeing, they do not see. And though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart have become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. Let me say it again. 
corruption flourishes when people try to live in the dark. We know this. This is a truth. This is a truth that people exploit with things that we want to keep secret, the things we want to keep hidden. People exploit for their own benefit. Let me tell you about a phishing scam. And I'm not Pastor Trent, so I'm not talking about the... Right? I probably did that wrong. I don't fish. I'm talking about phishing, P-H-I-S-H, like online phishing. There's a scam out there where a hacker will get in... Uh, get personal information from, uh, of you. So every one of us has been online. Uh, there's probably an old password or a current password of yours out there somewhere because of some data breach. It's inevitable. So they go on the dark web. They find this information. They do some research about you. They know your name, where you live, all that kind of stuff because it's all out there. And then they contact you. And with a menacing email or a phone call, they say to you, hey, I know this information about you. I have your internet search history. And if you don't give me thousands of dollars, I'm going to send it to all of your friends. And people send them money. Because they want to keep those things private. They want to keep those things secret. They, they, they've got something to hide. Corruption flourishes in the dark but it withers in the light. The people who have nothing to hide, I mean, I, I, heard some, I heard of somebody who had this happen to them and they had nothing to hide. And so they're like, okay, go ahead. Send it to all my friends. Do you want me to do it for you? You're not getting any money. Corruption flourishes in the dark, but it withers in the light. In the story of the healing of the man blind from birth, we see two different responses lived out when people are confronted with the light. And I promise you, when Jesus comes into the room, the light is there and you will be confronted by it and the choice must be made. The blind man embraced the light. And what changed? He, he, he grabbed hold of it. He said, I want this. I don't even fully understand what's going on. I don't know who this Jesus guy is. I kind of know his name. I know he healed me, but then I ran off. I'm still blind. I wash up. I don't know what he looks like. I have no idea. I couldn't pick him out of a room. In fact, we know that. We know later on when after everything that happened in his story, he's, he's wandering around. Jesus goes and finds him and says, dude, what's going on? And he's like, hey, stranger, how are you? Uh, this is kind of what's happening. He didn't have to know what was going on. He didn't have to have all the answers. He just knew that he had something he didn't have before, and he's not going to go back. He's not going to give it up. The Pharisees, they rejected the light. They, they wanted the status quo. They wanted to hang on to their authority and their power. They, they wanted to keep things uh, in the world under their control. But Jesus brings light. Jesus exposes the things that are false for the truth. And as disciples, we have to choose. We have to. Are we going to be the people of the light who live in light? Or are there going to be parts of our lives that we're trying to keep in the dark? Are there going to be parts of our lives that we try and, and, and protect ourselves from the exposure of things, you, you know, well, that's just nobody's business. Uh, things that, that, that we, we think, you know, it's not really hurting anybody. Why does it have to come out? I mean, seriously. I, uh, <clears throat> I had a moment where I, I watched somebody choose something that caused me great grief. Um, and I had no idea who this person is. I'm standing in Meyer, I'm standing in the checkout line, and there's a lady in front of me with this cart overflowing with stuff. And she's putting it all on the thing. And the checkers, beep, beep, beep. And it's a busy day, and there's a lot of chaos. And she had a couple of things down in the bottom of the cart, right? Um, and so at one point, she reaches down, and she grabs one of the things from the bottom of the cart, puts it there, but she leaves one thing there and just kind of pushes the cart along. And the checker's not going to see it. It was a 12-pack of LaCroix. And I'm standing there, and I'm thinking to myself, do I tattle? Do I make as if, oh, ma'am, you missed something, but we all know what's going on. And instead, I just, I chose to do nothing. 
I chose to pray for her because there's something now in her life that has to stay in the dark. And there's a price tag for that, even if it's something as ridiculous as a 12-pack of LaCroix. Jesus offered sight to the blind, to a blind man born from birth. This, this is true. It's also symbolic. He's blind from birth. This symbolizes something spiritual. This symbolizes everyone who is spiritually brought, uh, blind from the moment that we are conceived. And he offers something to us, restoration and redemption and healing from the darkness and the light. And when that man said yes to that, it cost him everything. We didn't get to this part of the story, but he gets condemned by the Pharisees for not condemning Jesus. How dare you have your sight on the Sabbath? How dare you have a miracle? How dare this man do this? How how come you won't condemn him? I don't know what's going on. All I know is what my life has changed to be. And so they say, get out. You can't be in the temple anymore. You can't be a part of polite society. You can't have all of the benefits that everybody else can have because you won't agree with us. You won't step back into the darkness. He's like, look, folks, I've been in the darkness. I don't want anything to do with it ever again. He knew what he'd received from the Savior. And he doesn't ever want to go back, no matter what it costs. Now, that's encouraging. We're really excited for him because it's happening to him. (laughs) But what about when it happens to us? When things come out into the light, it can be scary. (laughs) It... It introduces an entirely new world that we've never seen before. What we're witnessing here in John and in this moment of Jesus' ministry is a case being litigated between the light and the dark. Clear lines are being drawn between those who stand with Jesus and the light and those who resist the light for the continuation of darkness. And and there is no standing in the middle. There's no riding the line. You have to choose. You have to pick one side or the other. You have to be a child of light or a child of the darkness. You can't be a child of the light and and embrace corruption or chaos If we're going to experience the fullness of life in Christ, we have to do the hard work of eliminating the things that dwell in the dark within us, the secrets, the things that we're trying to hide, the things we're ashamed of. And that's hard. It might cost us a lot. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story about early on in my ministry. And it was, <clears throat> it was uh, the Sunday before communion uh, in that church. Uh, it was kind of a small traditional church. We did something called communion preparatory on the Sunday before communion. And hey, today's the Sunday before communion. <laughs> so on the Sunday before communion, we would do communion preparatory. And communion preparatory would often go something like this. Folks, uh, next week, we're getting ready to celebrate communion. And so over the course of this next week, I want to encourage you to prepare your hearts to receive this amazing blessing from God and from Jesus Christ. Now, how you're going to do that is you're going to start. I want, you to look, I want to encourage you to look at yourself, to look at your life. Come to the table forgiven. Now, this isn't about guilt. This isn't, oh, no, I've got to, you know, all these terrible things. And oh, no, 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 no. The table is a testimony to Jesus' power and forgiveness. So you don't have to measure some standard. But why come to the table burdened? So over the course of this next week, I encourage you, if you have something against somebody who's hurt you, If you haven't forgiven them, now's the time. I'm not saying you have to go run off and I forgive you, (laughs) but you can in your heart say, God, I need your help. Let me let this, help me to let this go. Um, Make it so that I treat them like this never happened. Make it so that I can treat them like they're forgiven. Help my heart. It's also possible that you've done something that's hurt somebody 
And over the course of this next week, I want you to go out and find them and ask for forgiveness. Ask God for forgiveness. Seek to make peace so that you can come to the table unburdened. A couple of days later, a member of the church knocks on my door. Pastor, I need to talk to you, okay? I have to confess something, okay? Uh, for the last, like, decade, I've been opening and using credit cards that my spouse knows nothing about, okay? Okay? And I've been juggling between different cards and, you know, doing the balance transfer and, and I'm buying things like crazy, okay? And I have about $30,000 worth of debt that my spouse knows nothing about. Okay. I'm afraid of what you're going to tell me I have to do. Well, then you already know what you have to do. But we're going to do it together. And so together, we sat down and we talked about what was true. We brought into the light what was hidden, and it was hard. And there was a lot of pain and anger and betrayal. And it took a long time to walk through and to work through all that that meant. But they did it. And they fought together for each other. Not against, but for each other. And it was beautiful to see the restoration. And it was timely. Because just a couple of years later, the one who had been sitting in my office confessing came down with cancer and lived for maybe 18 more months. but they were able to end their story together well and strong. They had something, a foundation by which they could walk through that terrible uh, tragedy of cancer. They had something on which to stand. Can you imagine what that spouse would have felt like if their, their, their loved one is gone and now suddenly a month later the bills start coming in and they find out out of nowhere, look what, uh, look, look what they did. It will be costly to bring things into the light. I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. There will be pain and feelings of betrayal because we're talking about real people who are hurting. It will be costly. But it's also costly to try and keep things in the dark. Costly in a different way. And if it's going to cost Either way, why not choose to pay the price that leads to eternity? Why not do the hard work that leads to peace and sustainability and life in the light? The reward for a life lived in the light is far greater than the cost of bringing things out. You can't live with both. God makes that abundantly clear in his word. You can't live in both realities. You have to choose. He says it in Luke 8. He says it in Luke 12, in Daniel 2, in 1 Corinthians 4, in Mark 4, in Ephesians 5. In Ephesians 5, he says this. If or you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, live as children in the light. You have, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. God continues to talk about it in Ecclesiastes 12, in Romans 13, in Acts 26. And then he says this in 1 John. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. And if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, 
We're liars. And we don't live the truth. But if we will walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Light that is beautiful and powerful, and it is the gift of God for us if we will choose it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, man, it's a scary thing to be your people because. Uh, you know, we get to be your people for free. It is by grace that we have been saved, not by our own works, but by him who came for us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And yet it costs us everything to be your people. All the things that we think that we're supposed to hang on to, all of the things that we think so that we can have uh, the things the way we want them and, and we can feel like we have comfort and peace. And, and those things might all just need to go away so that you and you alone can be everything so that a life, a life in the light is a life that we live. Father, help us, give us courage to eradicate the darkness, the secrets, the things that have no business being a part of our lives as children of the light so that you might be glorified, so that the people we love might be honored, and so that Jesus Christ may be praised. In his precious name we pray. Amen. I know that this challenge issued today may feel like a mountain insurmountable because of all that it could do, all that it could cost. I know because I have had secrets that have had to come into the light. I know. But there is one who is more powerful than anything that can happen. This is the testimony of these stories in John, that the light is more powerful than even death. And with him, with him you can do it. It won't be easy, but with him you can. May the God of power and strength and encouragement rest upon you and remind you who you are and to whom you belong and that he is the God of all glory at your right hand. And all of God's people said, amen.